Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,109 of our trek to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow as few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue our ongoing series of messages I've delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This series of messages will cover the Sermon on the Mount as recorded in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you today. Impact on our kids and an impact on us. Sometimes after the children's message I feel that's probably enough. We could probably go home now. I didn't hear an amen, so we'll just keep going then. (laughs) All right, we do thank you for being here today. We count it a privilege every week that we have an opportunity to gather together, and I thank you for the privilege to be able to, to bring God's Word to us as a congregation. And today, we're going to continue on the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And today is the Christian's prayer. It's not mechanical, but thoughtful. And today's scripture is found on page 1504 in your pew Bible. And I know this is pretty small up here for most of our eyes, but if you can read it, what I'm going to do today is show a comparison between the New International Version on the right-hand side here and the New Living Translation, which is what I normally use for my personal devotions, on the left-hand side. So I'm going to, to show the differences between the two just to give us a little bit better insight in our message today. But read along with me in the New International Version. Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us us today our daily bread, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. We learned last week that the scribes and the Pharisees had a problem with the way they gave, the way they prayed, in the way they fasted, because they did it in a hypocritical way in order to bring attention to themselves. But hypocrisy is not the only sin that we should avoid in our prayers. So is the endless babbling like the pagans. And the pagans here refers to non-Jews, those who were not part of God's chosen race in the Old Testament were considered pagans by the Jews. And the pagans or the Gentiles, as we'll also refer to them as, they think they will be heard because of their many words. Hypocrisy was the folly of the Pharisees, but repetitive babbling is the folly of the pagans. And when it's referring to pagans also, we don't like to think of ourselves as pagans, but in the, this, this particular context, we, unless we're Jewish, would be considered pagans. Now, hypocrisy is the misuse of the purpose of prayer because it diverts the glory from God to glory of ourselves. And babbling is a misuse of the nature of prayer because we're disregarding the real and personal approach to God into a mere repeating of words that have no substantive meaning. Again, we see a method of Jesus to paint a vivid contrast between two alternatives to indicate his way more plainly. First, he regarded the the practice of piety in general. He contrasted the Pharisaic way, which is flamboyant and selfish, with the Christian way, which was secret and godly. In particular now, regarding the practice of prayer, he contrasts the way the pagans, with their empty babbling, with the Christian way of meaningful communion with God. Jesus is always calling his followers to something higher than the attainments of those around them. Remember the difference between the Christian culture and the the culture of our world today. 
It's called the Christian counterculture because we're turning the world right side up from what it currently is. Jesus is calling his, his disciples, and we're part of those, to something higher than the, the attainments of the people around them, whether religious people or secular people. He emphasizes that Christian right living is more excellent because it's a living inward living. And our Christian love is broader because it's inclusive of our enemies. We're to love our enemies. And the Christian prayer is to be more profound because it's sincere and thoughtful. And in contrast to anything that the non-Christian community may present to us today. And last week we learned the way the Pharisees and the prayer issues they had with their praying because remember they went around on the street corners with their hands held high or in the synagogue and we were praying to God but they, what they were doing was trying to draw attention to themselves. And that's what we learned about the hypocritical way of prayer last week. Today we want to look at the pagan way of prayer. And the reason I'm displaying both versions here on the overhead is an, one example of how we can more effectively do Bible study. And one of those ways is to comparing different versions. There's a lot of great versions out there. And no matter what version you use, whether it's the King James, if you grew up with that, or if you use a, a little more modern version like the New International, which we have in our Pew Bibles, or like the New Living Translation, which I've used for several years now, comparing versions is one way to effectively do Bible study. And in verse 7, Christ starts to teach us in the NIV. He says, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Now, the same verse in the New Living Translation says, don't babble on like the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. So to me, it gives me a little bit more clarification of what is talking about this babbling of the pagans. And if we went back to the King James Version, if you're familiar with that, it says, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. And as can be seen, at least in my mind, it's probably because I have a simple mind and I need it broken down a little bit more refined, but that's a little more difficult for me to understand. It's harder because it's not clear whether the emphasis is on vain or repetition. And we see on the overhead, the NIV explains it when it says to, keep, to not keep on babbling. And I think we understand what babbling is. We probably do some of it ourselves and certainly Children at times seem to babble on. And as grandparents, you know, not being used to having young kids around, sometimes that constant chattering or talking can actually wear us out a little bit, I think. So when we think of babbling, when we compare it to the New Living Translation, it goes one step further that the babbling of the Gentiles or the non-Jews is explained by repeating meaningless words. Now, I've been in conversations before that I think some of the, what I've heard, been hearing is the repeating of meaningless words. And I probably certainly am apt to do that at times, too. And there's nothing wrong with perseverance or even persistence in prayer. Christ even commended this trait in the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18, where she kept begging the Lord over and over until he finally relented. But Christ refers here to being long-winded in your prayers, especially those who pray without thinking about what they're really praying. They're just rambling on in their prayers to God or to a God. As part of Christ's manifesto, remember Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is our marching orders. It's our manifesto as Christians within the kingdom of God of what we're to live like and what we're to do. And part of Christ's manifesto teaches us even how to pray correctly. And that's what we're looking at today. Now, Paul and I grew up in churches, not the same churches, but the type of churches where they would not even pray the Lord's Prayer on Sunday because they were afraid it would become vain repetition. Well, I appreciate that we recite the Lord's Prayer every week here at Putnam. But as we do, we should think about the words that we're praying and not just recite them because it's part of our pattern for worship every week. We should think about what the, prayer, the words actually mean. So I'm glad we do that. And Christ expands his teaching in this passage 
so that we understand that it's not the number of words that we're praying, but our heart attitude and what we are actually saying. We, did, we need to realize that we're having a conversation with God. When we're praying, that's all it is. And he's our father. Our prayers should be like the close, our, our conversations with the closest, most intimate members of our family, because that what it, that's what it is. The pagans thought that the more they said, the more likely they were to be heard. And it reminds me of the story of the prophets of Baal versus Elijah on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings. To get through to Baal, in fact, Elijah taunted them, saying, well, scream a little bit louder. Maybe he's asleep or maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he needs to be woken up so he can hear you. And they went to such lengths with the repetitive, meaningless babbles and chants and shouts, and they danced and they even cut themselves. What an incredibly yet misunderstood notion. What sort of God is primarily impressed by the mechanics or the statistics of prayer? And whose response is determined by the volume of our words that we use or the numbers of hours that we spend praying? In verse 8 of this passage, it says, do not be like them. Don't be like what the pagans do when they pray. Why not? Because the Christians do not believe that we have a God where we have to beg for mercy, forgiveness, or grace on a continual basis. All of us are free through faith, which we like to express as our believing loyalty in God. The fact is that many verses in Proverbs warns us against speaking too much. Because where sin, words are many, sin is not absent. And Christ even taught us in Matthew chapter 5, when we make promises, don't make these lengthy promises that are, you can't keep. He says, just boil it down. Yes, I will. Or no, I won't. And the same applies to our prayers. Christ isn't, or God isn't impressed by our flowery speech. It's like you're talking to your best friend. We are not to follow the pagan practices of prayer because we do not think like they do. On the contrary, in verse 8, it continues, it says, your father knows what you need of before you ask him. How awesome. God is neither uninformed that we need to instruct him, nor is he undecided that we need to persuade him about anything. He is our father, and as our father who loves his children, he knows all about our needs. Now, if your mind works like mine does, and hopefully it doesn't, but I say, well, if God knows everything I need, why should I pray at all? What's the sense in it? But as citizens of God's kingdom, we do not pray to inform God about things unknown to him or urging him to do his duty as though he was reluctant to do so. On the contrary, we pray to awaken ourselves to seek him and to exercise our faith by meditating on his promises. We are depraved also to relieve ourselves of the anxieties that build up in our, our lives, whether it's sickness or job related or financially related. We have these anxieties that boil up into us and we try to rationalize through them when all we need to do is pour them to our loving father as a child will pour their hearts out to a loving parent. By our praying, we are instructing ourselves and learning more about how to live right within God's kingdom. So let's contrast the way a pagan would pray with the way a Christian should pray. The praying of the Pharisees was hypocritical, and the pagans was mechanical and senseless. The praying of Christians must be genuine and sincere, not hypocritical. Our prayers must be thoughtful and not mechanical. Jesus intends our minds and our hearts to be involved with what we are praying. Prayer is seen in its true light, not as meaningless repetition of words or not a means for self-glorification. Prayer is true communion with our Heavenly Father. Christ teaches us in this passage what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the prayers of his disciples. And it was given by Jesus as a model of the genuine Christian prayer. And according to Matthew, he gave us this pattern. He said, pray like this. Or in the 
New International Version says, this is how we should pray. However, we're not obligated to pray just the Lord's Prayer. But let me, let me tell you, if you're struggling with your prayer life and you don't know how or when to pray, go to God's Word and pray through the Lord's Prayer. It's the model for every prayer. And if you look at and understand the words that are being said, then that is a prayer to God. And that we can also use it as a model or a template for how our prayer should be constructed in the same manner as what the Lord gave us as this template. The essential difference between the Pharisaic, Pharisaic, pagan, and Christian praying lies in the kind of God that we pray to. Other gods like Baal may like the mechanical chants or the screaming or the, the shouting, but not the living and true God revealed by Jesus Christ. Jesus told us to address him literally as our Father in heaven. Our Father wants us to address him personally. He's not an impersonal God. God is just as personal as we are, in fact, so much more so. He is so much more loving. God is not a tyrant who terrifies us with hideous cruelty, nor is he the kind of father that we read about sometimes or hear about who is an abuser, a cruel dictator, a playboy, or a drunkard. On the contrary, God is the picture of perfect fatherhood and his loving care for his children. God is powerful, and he's not only good, but he's great. The words in this passage, in heaven, denotes the dwelling place of our God. It denotes authority and the power at his command as the creator and ruler of everything. He combines fatherly love with heavenly power. And what, he lo what his love directs, he has the power to perform it. So we don't have to worry about whether God can perform what he's promised to do. In telling us to address God as our Father in heaven, we may come to him with the right frame of mind. First, before we pray, we, pray, we should recall who we're praying to. Then come to our loving Father in heaven with the appropriate humility, devotion, and even confidence. In Hebrews, it tells us to approach God's th throne boldly. We can have the confidence that we can go before God, and he not only wants us there, but he's listening and wants to take care of us. When we take time to, and focus ourselves towards God and recall the manner of God that he is, our personal, loving, and powerful Father, then the content of our prayers will be radically affected in two ways. First, God's concern will be given our priority. In this passage, it says, May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And secondly, our needs are in second place. And we can be committed to him. And it goes on to say, to give us, forgive us, and to not let us within this passage. In these two parts, the Lord's Prayer is concerned first with the glory of God and then with our human needs. And this is a pattern of prayer that we should establish in our lives. The two parallel parts are very similar to the Ten Commandments. For the Ten Commandments are also divided in the same order. The first five outlines our duty to God, and the second five outline our responsibility to others. And this is the pattern that Christ gave us for our prayer. The first three requests in the Lord's Prayer express our concern for God's glory, for his name, his rule, and his will. If our concept of God were that he's some impersonal force, like the force on Star Wars, then of course he would not have a personal name or rule or will that we needed to be concerned about. God's name is already holy, and it's separate, it's separate from and exalted over every other name. In heaven or on earth, God's name is holy. When we pray, we keep his name holy. And it says, hallowed be your name 
in the NIV. In the New Living Translation, between the two, two translations here, oop, hit the wrong button. I asked John which button was the laser button, and he says, it's the one that says laser on it here. <laughs> it says in here that we're to keep his name holy on here, and also to hallowed be their name. And that's how we pray it when we say it before as part of our service each week. We passionately desire that due honor is given to his name, that to our Father, our lives, our personal lives, and the life of a church and the world that we bring honor to his name. The kingdom of God is his royal rule. Again, as he's already holy, he is already king, reigning in absolute sovereignty over both nature and history. Yet when Jesus came to earth, he came to reestablish the kingly rule of God with all of its blessings of salvation and demands of submission, which his divine rule implies for all nations. Prior to Christ's coming, God had a, a chosen nation, which was the nation of Israel. When Christ came, he completed the law. He fulfilled the law, and now his kingdom's open to everyone throughout the world. So when we pray, may your kingdom come soon, it initiated Christ, was initiated by Christ's ministry and continues even today through Christ's witnesses, which we are part of. We're part of that church today. This kingdom will be fully established when Jesus returns for a second time in glory and power to take the reign of the world. And that is when Eden will once again be fully restored, not just as a tiny garden outside here of Israel or in the Babylonian area. It will be encompassed the entire world, the Garden of Eden fully restored. And we know based on Romans chapter 12, verse 2, what God's will is for us as citizens of his worldwide kingdom. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And part of that is our prayer life. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If we follow his teachings, it will bring his will to all the earth. And what we're talking about in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is his manifesto for us to bring his will to the entire earth. And that's what our calling is to be. God will establish his kingdom on earth so that we can rule with him in a combined heavenly council with his created divine beings. And it's our vocation individually as citizens of God's kingdom and us corporately as a church, the worldwide church, to be salt to the earth and the light of the world by taking on the character traits that he taught us in the Beatitudes and then in incorporating those into right living by spreading his kingdom and doing his will. That's our vocation. That's what we're called to do. Our jobs is a means to get us there. But our vocation is calling to build his kingdom. The prayers and the words of the Lord's Prayer should be done with sincerity. And if it's done that way, it will have a revolutionary implications for it expresses a priority for us as Christians. And as citizens of God's kingdom, we're constantly under pressure. Every day we face things in the news or online to conform to the self-centeredness of the secular culture. But we're met, as mentioned in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we're not to participate in this. We're to change our thinking. Because when we don't do that, when we don't change our thinking, we become concerned with our little name, our little kingdom or empire that we have in our world, and our own little silly wills that may not align with what God wants for us. In a Christian counterculture, our top priority and concern is not our name, kingdom, or will, but it is God's. Now, in the second half of the Lord's Prayer, we turn from God's affairs to our own. Having expressed our passion, passionate concern for His glory, we can now express our humble dependence on His grace. 
God is our Father in heaven, and he loves us with a Father's love. He is concerned about the total welfare of his children and wants us to bring our needs trustingly to him. When we strip away everything, and we overcomplicate so much in our lives, but when we strip away everything out of our lives, it boils down to three things. Our need for food, our need for forgiveness, and our need to be protected from the evil one. That's what our prayer should consist of. And that's what our lives need in order to be in line with God. When we drill, we will drill down on this actually next week also, when we're talking about money and possessions and why we fret and worry about those. So don't miss next week because we really will drill down on how our mind should be changed in that way. But he goes on in verse 11, he says, give us today the food that we need. And that's in the New Living Translation. He says, give us today the food that we need. And in the New International Version, it says, give us today our daily bread. And there's just a slight difference there. But the difference is that we're looking for God to provide our daily needs, whether we consider it bread or food. Um, and you'll see a little if you can see that a little A here besides a food that we need, and in a study Bible, and this is taken from Bible Gateway online if you have access to a computer, it's free. All these resources are free, or a study Bible, and it gives us a little point down here, which give us today our daily food. It says, give us today the food for today, or it could mean give us today the food for tomorrow. So it just expands our insight a little bit on what Christ is talking about here in this prayer. It doesn't change the verse, but it helps us to gain a little bit better understanding of it. And Jesus is saying that we should ask for our necessities rather than the luxuries of life. We may want to pray for a new boat, a new car, a new house, but the pattern here in the Lord's Prayer is for our necessities. And it's hard to imagine even that we would lack food or clothing or shelter in our Western world or most of the Western world but in other parts of the world, and even some in our country, this is a genuine issue. Why do we give to the Gospel Mission Food Pantry? Because there's people even in our community that can't make ends meet, that don't have enough to eat for even today. So Christ says, roll it back. When you ask for your needs, ask for your daily needs. The petition to God will give us our food and not deny us from what we need. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have to do something to gain that food. We do have to go out and earn a living. And as an analogy, think of the birds. God, Christ promised that the birds of the air would be taken care of, but he doesn't throw worms in our nest for them. They have to go out and dig up the worms. And in the same manner, God does, we can't sit at home and say, well, I hope I get some, some food today. God does expect us to go out and do what we can, our part, to gain that food. It seems that Jesus really wanted us as followers to be conscious of our day-to-day -day dependence on him. Thus, we are to live one day at a time. And once again, I'll drill down on that next week on why it's so foolish to worry about those things that God's already taken care of for us. In verse 12, it says, and forgive our sins as we have been forgiven, or for, and forgive our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Forgiveness is an indispensable part of life and health to our soul as food is to our body. Sin deserves to be punished, but when God forgives sins, he remits the penalty and drops the charges against us. In the New International Version, it says our debts, and we're forgiven our debtors. And that reminds us of owing money because when we sin, God needs to forgive those sins. And God says he'll forgive our sins in the same manner as we forgive those who sin against us. In the same way is what we need to depend on God. Once our eyes have been opened to the enormity of our offenses toward God, the injuries which others have done to us will appear to be quite small. And the last two requests 
should probably be, be understood in both negative and, po and positive. In the New Living Translation, it says, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. In the New International Version, it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, if you didn't understand what the concept was here, you might ask yourselves, well, will God lead us into temptation just to test us? But what the passage is saying here is, don't let us yield to that temptation. We'll have temptation around us, various times and various places, but we're not to yield to that. And our model prayer is to say, God, when I'm in that situation, give me strength not to yield to that temptation, whatever it might be. And one interesting concept or point is both in the New International Version and the New Living Translation, at the end of that verse, verse 13, it has a footnote here because in the old original manuscripts, or the oldest ones that we have, we don't have the original manuscripts, but the oldest ones that we have did not have this next sentence in it, but some of the new, more newer ones did. So they've included in a lot of Bibles, but it says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever, amen. And we say that in the Lord's Prayer when we say it or recite it every week. And the reason it's in a footnote in both the New International and New Living Translation is because it wasn't part of the oldest manuscripts that have been found, but it was in later ones after that. So some ver versions include it, some leave it out. That doesn't mean that it's not inspired, and it doesn't mean that it's not part of God's precepts. So we say it in our Lord's Prayer that we say every Sunday, and I think it's good because it's very true. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. And it ends the Lord's Prayer at that point. But there are two final ver ver verses after that. They're expanded, an expanded version of verse 12. And Christ is teaching us that if we are willing to forgive others who sin against us, then it shows a heart attitude of repentance. And that's why we're to forgive others, because then we are repentant to God, knowing that he will forgive our sins. It's an attitude that we need to receive forgiveness. But the opposite is also true. If we hold a non-repentant attitude, then we really haven't repented before God in our hearts. Jesus seems then to have given us the Lord's Prayer as a real model of real prayer, of a Christian prayer. It's a distinction between the prayers of the Pharisees and the pagans. And to be sure, one could recite the Lord's Prayer either hypocritically or mechanically or both. But if we mean what we say, then the Lord's Prayer is a divine alternative to the other forms of prayer, either hypocrisy or mechanical. And I challenge you to use the Lord's Prayer to allow Scripture to fashion your image of God. If you struggle with prayer, go to the Lord's Prayer and pray through it. Focus on the words that are being said and then use that as a pattern for other prayers that you might pray. In that case, we can recall the character and the practice of his presence, and we won't have to pray as hypocrites, but always with integrity. And we won't have to be mechanical in our prayers, but always thoughtful, like the children of God and citizens of God's kingdom that we really are. Now next week is Independence Day. And I know there's a lot of activities going on, and you, some may be out of town. But I encourage you, if you're in town and can, be here next week, because we're going to talk about money, possessions, and worry, and how those will impact our lives. And I think it's a lesson that I know I need, and hopefully all of us will need that. So let's close in prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for your love to us. As we pray the prayer, the model prayer that you gave us, is even if we just pray through this prayer, help us to be sensitive to the words of it. And as we fashion other prayers around this model, Father, that we can use it to honor and glorify your name, that we can bring glory to your name, but we can also bring our request to you, our request for food, for forgiveness, and that you'll keep us from yielding to temptation, Father. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 
I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.